Hey guys, today we're gonna talk about Steve and I's biggest regrets after getting a hair transplant, as well as the ones that we see being the most common. When guys write in the comment section I'll hear on my YouTube videos, or just write me personally on Instagram, and guys come into Steve's office after just having had a hair transplant, needing new work done, these are the regrets that people have the most often. So hopefully by going through all these, you guys will have none of these same regrets. So this is our top 10 regrets after having had a hair transplant. So the first regret is making an immediate emotional decision. Now this is a regret that I almost had, but actually I'm so lucky and thankful that I don't really have this regret, but it was, I was this close, <laughs> a hair's length away from making it. So when I first kind of thought about getting a hair transplant and first uh, realized how bald I was going. Actually, I'd already been on finasteride for a while. So I already knew that I was, you know, going bald and trying to prevent this hair loss. But I just, at one point, I just got fed up with everything. And I stopped using finasteride. And I was like, screw it. I'm not going to use any of this stuff. You know, and there are these things called hair transplants. I'm just going to go get a hair transplant. And that's it. That's what I'm doing. And I've got money. I'm going to go spend money on hair transplant. So I looked up online the nearest hair transplant clinic. I was in Manila at the time, in the Philippines living, and I went to a clinic. It was actually just a few blocks away from where I lived. And I walked in and I said, hey, I wanna have a hair transplant. And they said, awesome, we, know, we can get you on the books for a hair transplant. And I said, okay, cool. Like, do, you, uh, do you have some pictures like the doctor of his like, before and after photos? And I went through and I looked at the before and after photos and I'm so lucky that they didn't show me any doctored photos. It was the actual photos of their before and afters. And the ones that they were most proud of looked horrible to me. And so at that moment I was like, man, if this is the doctor's best work, maybe this isn't a good idea. And I mean, I'd, I think I'd already even put down a date that I was interested in having this hair transplant because I just walked in and was about ready to go. but. After seeing those before and afters, I walked out and, I, and then at that point I decided, I didn't do any more research or anything. I decided, okay, screw it. I'm, I'm just gonna go bald completely. I guess not a hair transplant and I won't use any preventative hair loss treatments. I'm just, I'm gonna be a bald guy. That's the way it is. That was a regret that I almost had. And that's because that was all made with like as a very emotional decision where it was just, frustration and making a decision, you know, such as a surgical decision out of frustration can often turn out really badly. The number two regret that I personally have is I wish that I'd understood just how progressive hair loss is and that even after a hair transplant, it's still progressive. You're still, your genes are working against you. The number three regret is that I wish that I'd kind of understood fully how important preventative hair loss treatments are for combating that number two, which is that hair loss is progressive. This is the story of how I personally relate to these two regrets. And it, it's kind of summed up a bit together. I've gotten on and off finasteride now. So many times that I literally don't even remember. <laughs> I don't know, four times, five times. It's been quite a few times. And each time has been kind of for a different reason, but never fully understanding, I think, how much my own genes are working against me. My dad, by the time he was my age, was bald, like horseshoe bald. And I mean, just a little, you, you couldn't even see. They're little tiny... Bruce Willis wisps of hair at the top of his head. And so that's my genes and that's, what's, that's what my body is trying to do to me. <laughs> First got on finasteride when I was probably around 20 years old and I didn't have any negative side effects, but I was talking to a friend of mine at the time and, and she's a pharmacist actually. And she was like, oh, I don't know about that. Like maybe you shouldn't be on that. I'd been on it for a year. And I decided, well, this pharmacist friend of mine had some, I don't know, misgivings about it. So I got off of it. So then my hair loss started to get worse. <laughs> so then um, over the course of another few years, it continued to get worse. I got back on finasteride. But at that point, I wasn't really sure, you know, 
if, if I could really even save my hair. So I got off it again. Um, that was when I started looking into the hair transplant thing. And so each time there'd been kind of this like emotional, can I save my hair? Then maybe I'll just give up. And then can I save my hair? And then after I got my hair transplants, I think my first, yeah, all, all of them. I think I've done all three hair transplants. I thought, well, man, my hair is actually looking really good now. And I read some more comments online from guys that you know, said that their lives had been destroyed by finasteride by taking it and uh everything had changed you know their uh, their sex drive was gone down they had never come back they were depressed all these these kind of things and i again never had any issues with it none of my personal friends had ever had any negative side effects from it but that scared me and i thought well i've already got this hair i already look pretty i look look really good now so maybe i should just go ahead and get off of it and that I spent, I think, probably around four years or so off of finasteride. And over the course of that time, um, I was using a laser uh, helmet. So that was helpful. Like it, it stayed, my hair stayed, but it just started getting a little bit, the actual, I don't think I really lost hair, but the actual hair like strands themselves just got a little bit more fine, a little bit more thin, you know? And so then my brothers got on finasteride. Uh, this combination pill that, that Steve recommended to them, um, minoxidil, a finasteride combination pill. And my brother's hair came back like unbelievably. It looks like one of them went from where he was really, he was like, man, I'm really going to go bald to now he, it looks like he's never lost a single hair in his life. And so they had no side effects whatsoever. And so I thought, man, I'm going to go ahead and get back on that. So I got back on now using that and the laser helmet. And now my hair looks better than it's ever looked. And it all came back a hundred percent completely. And, um, I've just realized now that like, man, if I'm not having any negative side effects from this personally, I've been on and off so many times. So all these things that I've heard, which are like, once you get off, everything crashes and you can never get anything back. Like I've never had any experience like that. Um, I, I want to give my hair the best shot. So at this point, I think, <laughs> I think I'm going to just stay on it <laughs> forever. So unless there's some kind of miracle cure, because this combination is really working and my hair looks amazing and it's super easy there. Um, it's a tiny little pill and, uh, and then the laser every other day I'm sitting watching TV or something and it's super convenient. I can keep it up and my hair looks great now. So David, one of my regrets, this is number four is that I never thought it would take more than one hair transplant to make me happy. Uh, of course, I was very young at the time and naive. Um, and I've parlayed that to how I educate patients now that you should always plan on two procedures. So my personal experience, and this was no fault of anyone uh, back in the day where I thought that, you know, if I get a hair transplant, I'm taking hair from the back, I'm putting it in the front and my troubles are over. Number five is I wish that I'd considered both FUE and FUT. And I'd kind of put them together a bit more as a plan. The surgeon that I went to for my first surgery only did FUT. So automatically that's what I got done. I hadn't really thought much beyond just trying to get as much hair as I could in that one procedure. I hadn't really thought of them as being something that could be combined together the way that I do now. I think that a lot of guys who are starting out younger like me who have had significant hair loss are going to be better off actually getting both of those done at some point uh, for multiple different reasons. So I'm probably going to be going here before too long in the next year or so and actually getting a body hair transplant, probably from my neck or something like that, um, into a scar that I have from my first surgeon. Um, here uh, on the back of my neck. And we can take those, I don't have to use any of my donor hair and put them into the scar. So that would be obviously an FUE procedure that I'd be using. At some point in the future, even now after having these three FUT strip procedures, I've got gray hair, but I still 
am in a position where I can go back and get another FUE procedure because I still have lots of donor area. It's the same thing that my friend, uh, Dr. Daniel McGrath just recently did. I think he's had two or three strip procedures in the past. And then now he just went back. He's an older guy, I don't know, fifties or so, probably mid fifties. And he just went and got an FUE procedure will probably be his last procedure. And now his hair looks great. And he's a, you know, an older guy. And also his testosterone levels and all those things are probably lower. He's not having you know, his DHT attack his hair the same way that he would when he was younger. So he's probably good now. So that's like a big success story. So really think of those things as something that can be used to be combined. Um, there's a lot of benefits to FUT. And there are a lot of benefits to FUE that both strip and the the punch procedures. And I think from my comments, I see from you guys, a lot of guys are very much one or the other. Like, no, I have to get FUE done because there's no scar. I have to get FUT done because they move more hair all at once. Well, those are kind of both sort of true and not true, but best often is actually combining the two together um, over the course of a lifetime. Number six is I wish I had realistic expectations. Um, this was very challenging for me as a very young guy losing my hair, like for many out there. Um, I was devastated and my expectations were beyond the moon. I wanted hair like my Italian friends where I grew up and I thought a hair transplant was gonna do that for me. I don't really fault the doctor that did the first procedure on me. My hairline is definitely higher than I had originally wanted it, but for all good reasons in that time that it was placed where it was, and I'm still working on that, and uh, well, that's another conversation. My realistic expectations were unrealistic. When you go into a procedure by today's standards, don't make the same mistake I made. Make sure you spend time talking to your surgeon. The, my favorite surgeons are the ones that talk about the worst case scenario, not the best case scenario. What can go wrong? What if this doesn't work? What are the guarantees? Where's that hairline gonna be placed? And then some before and after photos of people maybe with your type hair, your type hair loss. But going into this, think about this, going into this with the unrealistic expectations before you even have the surgery sets you up for failure. Whether it's the day of the procedure, you go back to your house and you're looking in the mirror, I don't like the hairline, that's not a good start. Whether it's when your healing is completed and you're looking at yourself and you're seeing a little bit of the residue left from the scabbing and whatnot, and you think the hairline's too high because you had unrealistic expectations of how low that hairline was gonna be. This is all about communication between you and your surgeon. It's got to be clear. The four month follow-up, the eight month follow-up, the 12 month follow-up, all are gonna be completely unsuccessful and you're gonna be disappointed over spending a lot of money and not getting what you want. So don't make the same mistake I made. Go into this educated and make sure that you pay close attention to the realistic expectations. If you have thin, fine hair and you're looking at a photo of someone from the Middle East with thick, ropey, dark hair, you're not gonna get that result. These are unrealistic expectations. So that is probably the biggest mistake you can make going into a hair transplant. Everyone's genes are very different. A lot of times when we look at these cosmetic procedures, we think, okay, well, if they got that one thing, then I'm gonna also get, I'm gonna also look the same way. And our eyes deceive us a bit that way. There are certain kinds of cosmetic procedures that can probably be done a little bit more directly, uh, you know, apples to apples, but hair is very individual. So it's, it's individual in the same way that, that growing muscle is very individual, you know, and body types are very individual. If you were looking at a workout plan, a trainer had taken a hundred people through his workout routine, which was an eight week routine. And he showed you a picture of the person that had had the best results. This guy went from being this kind of, kind of like skinnier dude with a little bit of a belly to looking, you know, more Arnold Schwarzenegger like. He pro promised you or showed you a picture of this person and said, hey, you do this eight week procedure exactly like him, look at this result. Well, that would be kind of unrealistic, right? Because not everyone has that exact result over the course of eight weeks. And you might work out even harder than the guy who had that result. And that doesn't mean that you're going to get that same result because people's genes are different. So it's not a negative to that trainer 
because he took you through the exact same routine. It's just people's genes are different. What would probably be a better thing of doing is to see those 100 people or see, you know, a pool of 50 and their result and go, hey, this is kind of an average of the people that actually did a good job during this. Um, these are all the people, these 50 that actually worked out. The other 50 were kind of slackers. But these 50 worked out. They did, did what I told them, and this is their result. And then you can guess that you'd be somewhere in the midst of those 50. This is not a regret that Steve or I thankfully personally have, but this is one of the most common regrets that we hear from people that contact us after just having had a hair transplant, having their result grow in and it not being what they expected, is that they went to a person that doesn't specialize in hair transplants. Fortunately, there are a lot of great hair transplant surgeons so that that's all they do. And why wouldn't you want someone doing your hair transplant that had done thousands of hair transplants before, that had spent years probably working with another hair transplant surgeon prior to ever doing their own procedures? They've seen everything. You know, they've, they've had patients of every different type. They have a really good idea of what to expect. So they're also going to be much better at consulting you before the hair transplant and giving you an idea of what you can expect based off of the kind of work that they do versus a cosmetic surgeon, for instance, that had done 50 hair transplants. And maybe they had 10 of those turn out great, but that's not really the chance that you want to take, right? My number nine regret is something that I still have to struggle with on a pretty regular basis when guys write me because they're always mentioning new technologies. And so I look into these. I, I'm always very curious and like, David, have you heard about this latest thing? And they, you know, talk about uh, DHI, smart graft, safe graft, master graft, precision graft, you know, all these different like names of these super new technology procedures. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things in themselves in the hands of an excellent full-time qualified hair transplant specialist. They could be fantastic tools, probably all of them. But the problem is that as I start to look into them, at first I'm like, wow, really? Like this? They're like, yeah, yeah. So they can take out your hair and then all of it will grow back. Like all of your donor hair will grow back. And I'm like, really? And so I'll start looking to these different PDF documents about this and I'll go to the websites or they'll say, yeah, so like there's this new DHI or smart graft or whatever the thing is. And this is 100% painless. There's no pain whatsoever. And they don't even make an incision. And I'm like, wow, really? So I, I start looking into this. And let me give you a couple of the things that, for instance, are the most popular that they'll say. So one is 100% painless procedure. Well, that sounds awesome, right? Nobody wants pain. But how do they numb you? How do they numb you? Because you have to numb someone in order to extract hair. Even if you pulled hair and there's no knife or anything like that, if I just pull one of your hairs out of your face, it's going to hurt, right? Or out of the back of your head, it's going to hurt. So if that's the case, then I guess I have to numb you before I pull it out. And if you numb somebody, what do you have to use? A needle. So if you use a needle, there's pain, right? <laughs> like everybody, you stick them with a the needle, even the tiniest of needles, and there's some pain. So this just doesn't make any sense. It's like when I did my last procedure like five years ago or so with Dr. McGrath, I would oftentimes tell people, man, I had no pain during that procedure um, or, or afterward. But I wouldn't lie to somebody and say that, it didn't hurt when they numbed me, like <laughs> when, when they put the numbing stuff into you, you know, and they shoot you with the needle, like you feel that, like it doesn't, it's not horrible, but like, it doesn't feel good to have shots put, put in you. So um, there is no 100% painless procedure. That's just absolutely impossible. And the same thing, like the, we don't make any incision. Well, how, how can you possibly put something into someone without making some type of incision, even if it's a tool that like shoots it into the person, it still has to shoot through skin. So it just, it just doesn't make any sense. And every time I look into these, I get kind of excited about them because I'm like, man, like this sounds amazing. Like all, yeah, again, all the hair is going to grow back because we cut it a certain way. But if that was the case, then why are the top surgeons in the world not doing each one of these, right? So I'll give you a, uh, an instance. 
Dr. McGrath, uh, you know, who Steve works with, and a good friend of mine who did my last procedure, he went to get his FUE procedure done, uh, I don't know, a year ago or something yeah. like that. And he went to this surgeon, Dr. Bolback, who is in Beverly Hills. And many of the top celebrities in the world, Perez Hilton went to Dr. Bolback to get his recent hair transplant surgery. And his schedule stays packed, even being one of the most expensive hair transplant surgeons, because he's world renowned as being, you know, an incredible surgeon, right? And he doesn't use any kind of special machine. None of these popular machines that I just mentioned, he literally uses like a, like a handheld, to punch. a handheld little punching tool, you know, and does every single one of them by hand himself. And there's nothing revolutionary or special <laughs> about- His hands are special. His, yeah, his hands are, exactly. If you wanted to get a, a golf ball, you know, from the tee into the hole. If you could pick the world's most incredible, expensive driver, golf club, right? You could pick that and you could buy that and you could give it to like the club pro. And this is like the best golf club that you can buy in the whole world. It claims that it can hit the, the ball another 50 extra yards. It's made out of graphite or some special material they just invented. And you give that to the, the club pro. Would you, do you think there's a better chance that that club pro is going to hit that ball into the hole with this specialized golf club? Or your other option is a wooden golf club, but Tiger Woods gets to hit the ball. Would you pick Tiger Woods with the wooden golf club or the club pro, your local club pro, with the specialized graphite golf club? I would definitely be Tiger Woods, right? So it's so much often like not about the specialized little tool thing as it is the surgeon and how qualified they are and how much experience they have. As an example, David, I got a phone call from a patient a few days ago um, that was speaking to a doctor that I personally know and I have worked with before. So he's telling me that he's going to have an FUE procedure. And when he does the extractions, the way that he does the procedure and how he injects the donor zone with a cell, he's guaranteeing the patient that he's going to get a 40 to 50% regrowth of his grafts. Now I've been around a while and I know this industry pretty well and I'm not a doctor. That just doesn't make too much sense to me. And it just made me kind of scratch my head and wonder like where that came from. And think about this, wouldn't that be something that if that was possible, which I hope it is, all the doctors would be doing it. It's a very, very tight industry. It's a very, very small industry and all the doctors know each other. Either it's possible and he's keeping it to himself. So he decided, I want to be the only surgeon that, well, one, many surgeons use a cell. So, but I want to be the only one that came up with the idea of injecting it into the back of someone's head. Okay, so he came up with that idea. So then he decided to keep it a secret and not tell any other surgeons about this amazing, miraculous thing that brings all, you know, half your donor hair back, right? So that's a little bit shady in itself to not tell anyone else. Two, if he is trying to keep it a secret, well then why is he telling patients what he does? Because obviously they're gonna tell their doctors, right? So then he's obviously not trying to keep it a secret. So why wouldn't he tell other doctors if it actually works? You know what I mean? Yes. So either it's gonna instantly become the biggest new thing or it's just, a lie, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's, it's like exosomes, for instance, that Dr. McGrath started doing. He didn't try and keep it a secret. Immediately, he told tons of other surgeons, and now there are a bunch of surgeons around the country that were like, wow, yeah, this really works. We're gonna start offering this too. And now they're all doing it. I mean, there's just no way to really keep a secret like that because patients are gonna uh, tell other, other surgeons and other patients, or it doesn't work and they're not gonna tell, you know what I mean? <laughs> You're gonna stop doing it. Yeah, I think the top doctors in the industry, they've put in their time, and this is a very lucrative industry, and they're doing really well. And their main goal, besides all happy patients, is to provide a better result, to provide a better industry. We do these videos so that patients have better education. Number 10 is something that 
I regret a little bit because I feel like I could have done a little bit more research before having my first hair transplant. At the time, YouTube was a brand new thing when it came to hair transplants. And there are only a couple of doctors on YouTube even mentioning hair transplants. So it was a much harder to do research than it is now. So you, I just kind of had to take what I heard on the internet or YouTube at face value and just hope that those people were being honest. And there were a couple of things that that surgeon who did my first uh, transplant said that I later found out to not be true. Now, on the other hand, I see completely uh, preposterous lies <laughs> on the internet since putting my information online. I got a message the other day on Instagram with a picture of my before and afters, and it was on a website in Turkey saying that I'd gone to this clinic in Turkey and gotten my hair transplant. And I've been to Turkey once, but it never got a hair transplant there. I've seen comments with people mentioning on other videos where I'm discussed saying that their uncle does my wig. So I, I not, I don't have a hair transplant, or even if I did, what, what this is actually a wig. I, I feel like my hair would look even better if it was a wig, but it's not a wig, and that's just so outrageous that if you read this comment and it said my uncle is who does this guy's wig, why would anyone lie about that? Why would anyone make up such an outlandish lie? But they just do. So the internet is the best place in the world to do research obviously. But there's also the most misinformation on the internet, and especially in things like YouTube comments or, you know, Facebook comments and these things like that. Of course, I scroll just like you and I, and I try and sort of pick out gems here and there. But you really have to do your full research and also talk to specialists. I think that's one of the reasons I've gotten on and off an asteroid so many times is just reading YouTube comments and going like, oh my gosh, is, could this be true? So the more that you can, can stay away from just believing those things as hard truths, you know, just because someone's, you know, a keyboard warrior took the time to write it, uh, the better off that you'll be. So hopefully this helps keep you guys away from having some of the regrets that both Steve and I do um, and other patients write us with uh, you know their biggest regrets and instead you have an awesome result and all your dreams come true.